Hello and welcome to News Click. Under the present BJP government, we have been seeing a steady decline in the strength of the regulations that protect our environment. This is quite similar to what the US is witnessing under Donald Trump. To discuss the recent amendments made to different regulations, we have with us today D. Raghunandan from the Delhi Science Forum. Welcome, Raghu. So, starting with the new national forest policy, this policy is largely being viewed as something that allows for the privatization of forests. So, what can you tell us about that? There are, I think, three features of this new national forest policy which stand out. Uh, the first is an old uh, habit, uh, which is to speak of forest cover and tree cover in the same breath. Hmm. So, when you announce targets for forest oblique tree cover, then you are saying that if you have a mixed forest, a mixed natural forest with biodiversity, with trees and shrubs and bushes and grasses, etc. Or if you have plantations hmm. of pine or sal or eucalyptus, hmm. you are talking of both of these in the same breath. We do have a fairly clear definition of what a forest is and we do know that a bunch of trees don't make a forest. Yeah. Uh, whereas, this policy, as in many previous policies, conflates these two mm. and talks of forest oblique tree cover. So, India has set a target for itself as well as in commitments to Paris, mm. saying we will increase our forest oblique tree cover to 33 mm. percent. That's not the same thing. Mm. We've currently got forest cover of about 20 odd percent. It would have been a meaningful target if we had said we'll increase that to 33. But if you plant eucalyptus along the highways, you may reach a target mm. of 30 odd percent of tree cover and call it a forest, yeah. uh, which it is not. Yeah. Because a forest plays, very, performs very wide ecological services, uh, prevention of soil erosion, mm. capturing water, from rainfall and feeding uh, water bodies and rivers, mm. uh, engendering biodiversity. None of these services are performed by uh, a bunch of trees and forests perform very useful social services in providing to forest dwellers and in the neighboring areas fuel, fodder, mm. medicinal plants, uh, non-timber forest produce, etc. So, this conflation is one uh, part. Two uh, new features in this forest policy, which is what you are talking about is, uh, the first is it, this new policy makes a virtue out of, let us have what it calls plantation forests. Yeah. So, let us plant uh, commercial mm. timber species mm. like sal, sesame, uh, etc., and use that to increase the production of timber. And it makes a virtue of this by saying if we use this timber, then we can reduce the uh, utilization of steel or aluminium, mm -hmm. which will contribute to our climate change. Uh, efforts. This takes a cue from uh, developed countries, particularly in the north, hmm. uh, Sweden, Canada, Norway, which have vast unpopulated forests, hmm. which can then be used for harvesting of timber, mm -hmm. which countries like that use in house building, uh, etc., thereby saving on. Hmm. In India, that is not the case our forests are already very poor hmm. and if you are going to use plantations in forests in order to provide for utilization of timber in construction etc., then the proportion of mixed forests that you already have will only go down uh, further. Hmm. So, that is one big danger in the new policy. The other is linked with this, the policy talks of increasing uh, the area under such plantations, both inside forests, in fringe forest areas, hmm. 
in degraded land and outside forest and doing this through a PPP yeah. mode, yeah. which then introduces the private sector hmm. into forest management for the first time. It's also something, uh, uh, joint forest management is also something that's right. Proposed. Well, joint forest management has been there. The idea of joint forest management was to involve communities of forest dwellers, tribals, etc., who have been conserving the forests where they are because they have a stake mm -hmm. in preservation of uh, the forest. This is very different, however. The stake of the private sector is not in forests, mm -hmm. it's in timber. Yes. So they're not interested in preserving forests for water conservation, for soil conservation, for fuel, fodder, and non-timber forest products. They only want the timber. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have a no stake in ecological conservation of the forests they have a stake only in the production value of forests for timber hmm. uh, and other such useful products. So all in all, I believe the new forest policy is uh, the thin end of the wedge hmm. to uh, convert forests into plantation areas, which is what the British had started doing 200 years ago. Hmm. And we've seen the effects of that in Himachal, Uttarakhand, yes. where you've got denuded slopes because of virtual uh, monocrop plantations of pine and other hmm. such species, and where the old mixed forests have virtually disappeared yeah. uh, with great ecological harm in the area. And we've seen the loosening of the soil leading to greater land slips yeah. and uh, so on. This is going to increase that further. And if you allow the private sector into it, that's going to destroy the system of management and to destroy benefits to the people of whom an estimated 120 million hmm. live in or around forests. Yes. Uh, so it has huge societal as well as ecological impact. When we talk about this conversion from forest to plantations, of course, there's a lot of Absolutely. tribals and forest dwellers. Exactly. What does the policy say about the rights of these people? It of course says that uh, we will ensure that we are promoting non-timber forest produce and the stakes of the local people and so on. But if this policy is follows in the spirit in which it is uh, written, it will reduce those kinds of species which local communities can use for their benefit hmm. rather than species which would be used for commercial purposes especially for timber. So moving on to the uh, new coastal zone management, yeah. the notification for the coastal zone management, yeah. that is also along similar lines. It is reducing the uh, limit of the area That's that right. can be that comes under regulations. And it's also, uh, again, very it's giving very weak protection Absolutely. to these areas. Absolutely. And I think this this follows a series of dilutions hmm. of the coastal zone uh, uh, rules and regulations. Uh, mind you, not only by this government, hmm. such dilutions have been attempted in the past as well, yeah. but this government has gone about it extremely systematically hmm. and with a sense of purpose. Hmm. Many of these, the forest amendments, the coastal zone amendments, many other amendments which this government has been doing are in fact continuations of what it had earlier commissioned the TSR Subramaniam Committee's uh, report, mm. which uh, the Parliamentary Standing Committee had rejected, mm. but which the government is now trying to introduce many of those recommendations through the back door, through one kind of notification or new forest policy. Mm -hmm. So without doing the whole package, they're introducing bits of it uh, here. And in the coastal zone regulation in particular, there have been a series of amendments mm -hmm. to the coastal zone regulations culminating in this new uh, zone. And I think it is very significant that more than a dozen of these uh, new amendments hmm. that the government has moved have not been put to public scrutiny. Okay. So you say that you are doing this for the public good, hmm. but by excluding the public. Hmm. 
So you're not involving the public, you're not notifying the public that this is what we are planning to do, inviting objections. None of that has uh, taken place. And in fact, the new notification specifically says that we do not need to do this process of public uh, notification hmm. for most such amendments. Hmm. So that means even in future, they don't need to uh, notify in public, they don't need to invite amendments, they can just pass executive orders and uh, do that. Of course, as you say, there are serious dilutions of the coastal zone uh, regulations. The 100 meters has now become 50 meters hmm. and a range of activities have now been permitted hmm. uh, in this. Infrastructure activities, ports to conform with the government's Sagar Mala hmm. uh, project, hmm. infrastructure projects, pipelines, roads, all these are now permitted. Uh, you can easily do those uh, uh, kinds of uh, projects. They have permitted mining hmm. of uranium, of thorium, and specifically saying even if res these resources are available elsewhere, you will be allowed to do this uh, within the uh, coastal zone. And they've also used this to introduce ecotourism hmm. uh, activities right within 50 meters as if you can't do ecotourism 100 meters away from the yeah. coast, but you need to go right up to the shoreline mm -hmm. uh, to do it. And not just in the shore, but they've specifically allowed such projects even in mangrove areas, yeah. which as you know, are highly sensitive mm. and are the first line of defense against cyclones and storm surges uh, and so on. They've allowed that. But following they have said that if you cut down mangroves, you have to plant three times the area. But I was, that is I was going again, to, not the same. I was going to say precisely, this is what they are doing with forests as well. They say you can cut down the forest provided you do five times that much compensatory afforestation. Hmm. But I could cut down a 100 year old or a 300 year old mixed forest and plant eucalyptus and they would be happy. Yeah. And the same thing will apply in mangroves uh, as well. Uh, I think the key dilutions are not only that there is a dilution of the coastal zone regulations and thereby opening up the coasts for so-called developmental hmm. activities, which in an era that we are going through now where coastal erosion is already taking place in significant measure will open this up more to coastal erosion, mm. will further destroy livelihoods of fisher folk and others who are dependent on uh, the coasts and promote ecologically destructive activities, which are also going to weaken our defenses against uh, erosion, yeah. rising sea levels, which we know are going to happen with uh, uh, climate change. You should in fact be thinking of having a buffer zone Hmm. from the coast, not constricting it from 100 yeah. to 50, but going from 100 to 200, so that you can build defenses hmm. against uh, sea level rise. The key argument given to defend these regulations and is that this is for the sake of development. So, uh, environment basically has to is sort of looked as, like put aside for the sake of development. So, how do we stress upon the importance of that? What do we make what do we say is more important? See, this has been a very hmm. old and oh. I would say hackneyed argument. Hmm. Uh, any serious uh, perspective on development would know that development must go hand in hand with environmental protection and conservation. Hmm. Otherwise, you will not have development. Hmm. Like I just gave the example, if I build on the coasts, I promote development hmm. for let's say a hotel, hmm. but I destroy the development of fisher folk. So it's not just development which is being promoted, but development for somebody hmm. against the development of somebody else. Hmm. That's one. Secondly, what looks like development in the short term, a few jobs in hotels, some infrastructure there, but 
paving the way for destruction of the coastline, for entry of the sea further inland. Hmm. That hotel is likely to get washed away. The best example I can give for this is we saw during the Uttarakhand floods yes. a few years ago, settlements which had come up, townships which had come up along the river hmm. without proper environmental clearances or building clearances got swallowed up hmm. by the flooding uh, Ganga and its uh, tributaries. So what looked like development uh, two years ago would look like destruction and damage two years from now. Hmm. So it's a very short-sighted view of development which does this counterposing of development and environment. Hmm. I think our viewers need to know that India is a signatory to many international uh, conventions and treaties such as the Sustainable Development Goals. We are signatory to the Paris Agreement on Climate. Hmm. All of these treaties make it a point to stress that environment and development are two sides of the coin that you can't have one without the other. Yes. That if you promote ecologically destructive development, even that development will not last. Hmm. So thank you, Raghu, for joining us today in this discussion. Thank you. And thank you for watching this clip.